everybody again. Um, anyone that didn't make it to the keynote earlier, um, you're one of the uh, little events that didn't happen things. We were talking about selection bias for people that didn't turn up to my keynote, but anyway. Um, I'm going to go through um, talking about chaos architecture right now. For me, this, is, this really comes out of it being the availability model for cloud native applications. If you're trying to build stuff that is really cloud native, taking advantage of all the things, how should you think about the, the, the right model for building highly available applications there? So I'm going to start off with some questions, because uh, back when I was an uh, overall you know, architect, I was the an overall architect at Netflix. And my job then wasn't to tell people what the architecture should be. It was to ask people awkward questions and try and get people to remember these awkward questions and ask each other those awkward questions. And that helps steer people into good architecture. Right. So I'm going to go through a few of these questions. Um, and this is, this is one of those questions. What should your system do when something fails? And the usual response is, I don't want it to fail. <laughs> And then you go around that, and a couple of hours later, you finally admit that well, it, when it fails, it should do something. Um, and it's going to have to do one of two things. And it's either going to have to stop, because you're not sure what state everything's in, and that's worrying, because you don't want things to stop. Or it's going to carry on with some kind of reduced functionality. All right. And maybe you can hide the failure enough, if you're careful, to make sure that it carries on and ignores the fact that something's failed. So those are that sort of the thing. But that's basically the two choices you get. Um, and let's be a bit more specific. If a permissions lookup fails, what's the right thing to do there? Now this is, becomes a bit more application dependent. Because um, a lot of the time, people go, if, I, if something fails, I just throw an exception. That's, I'm just coding away. If this fails, exception, blah, 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 whatever language you're in, you say, I failed to read the thing I wanted to feel, I read the data I expected to see, so I'm just going to kind of throw an exception and stop and then some return failure up, send back up 500 or some, something back up to the customer. But the way you, this was something we took a little bit of time with at Netflix, because the cost of failure at Netflix is that you don't get to watch a movie. Um, but if you're not sure if somebody is actually supposed to be able to watch a movie, but it looks plausible, like they look like they have a cookie that maybe is out of date, right? And you want to revalidate that cookie, and you can't revalidate the cookie. So what's the cost of continuing is they get to watch a movie for free. And that's not too expensive, right? We can afford to let you watch a movie for free because it's our fault that we can't tell whether you should be able to do thing, this thing or not. So that works for Netflix. Now, if you're in banking and you're trying to move a trillion dollars from one account to another, probably the best thing to do is stop <laughs> at this point, rather than go, I'm just going to assume that even though I can't tell whether the, you know, the fraud system's down, I should probably just stop. All right? Or maybe if the, most of my transactions are really small transactions and I can cover it, like the marketing, the marketing problem, you know, um, the marketing hit from, from having an outage and pissing off customers by stopping may be less than the actual probability that someone's trying to do a fraudulent transaction in your system. So maybe you should just continue and let it go through even though the fraud system's down. And I know one I saw an online payment system where this was actually the algorithm. If, some, if they couldn't tell, they would just continue. And if, if there was some fraud, they just ate the fraud. I mean, there's like it's a cost of doing business. You just take it off a budget and say, yeah, our fraud was higher right now because our system was down. And again, it's our fault that you couldn't do it. So think about this. Think about what is the actual cost. Can you cover that cost in the business itself? Or do you want to be able to just deal with it? Or, or is the right thing to do to actually stop? And there's a, a nice, nice, um, hang on a there we go. Um, a nice paper on this by Pat Helland. It's sort of in a related area. Uh, it's called Memories, Guesses, and Apologies. And he's really talking about database systems. Database system is a system that says, please remember this thing for me. And then a bit later, you say, can you remember this thing? And it guesses what you, asked, what you told it last time. Or maybe it just apologizes, I have no idea what you're talking about. All right, those are the three outcomes you can kind of get, or the three stages of dealing with the database. And one of the points he makes in, in his paper 
is that sometimes the code you use to try to handle the exception is actually so complex and so poorly tested that it, it usually blows up and makes it worse. And the best thing might be to just say, call this customer service number. And somebody nice will then talk you through, and people are very adaptable. They can handle way more problems than they have. They don't like core dump on the phone, right? Because you hit some code path that had never been executed before. So it's sort of encouraging people to think about the consequences and also that escalating a human being is actually, uh, in many cases, a good outcome or a good way of apologizing to the customer that they couldn't get something done. That doesn't work every time, but it's, it's, it's a little a short paper on that. So here's another favorite question of mine. Do you have a backup data center? And of course you have a backup data center if you're doing some interestingly significant piece of business. Everyone does. Um, and then the follow-up question, how often do you fail apps to it? This is where people start to look worried. Um, you get a few, you know, a few people get, yeah, we not very often or never. I heard never quite a lot. Um, and then how often do you fail over the entire data center at once? In some highly regulated industries, this happens maybe once a year, or maybe that's also never, um, or we're working on it. Or one time, it was like we just spent nine months planning on it and managed to successfully do it for the first time a few weeks ago. I'm very proud, right? OK, that was cool. And, what, and they found all kinds of problems. And they don't want to do it again, because <laughs> it's hard, right? So I call this availability theater. Uh, you've heard of security theater. This is where you take your shoes off at the airport because it makes you f everyone feel more secure in some strange way, although it's never it's saved anybody any real practical problems at the airport. Um, this is the, you spending all the money on a highly available backup data center that you hope you will never actually fail over to, right? But you've gone through the motions, you've ticked the boxes, you have your backup data center. But if you ever actually try and use it in anger, you're in a world of hurt and you will spend days trying to get everything working right in the new data center. And one other thing I discovered when I lived through this, uh, actually when I was at eBay, um, we failed over and it took a day or two because we just weren't ready for it. And then when failing back took a month or two. It doesn't take the same amount of time to fail back. It takes orders of magnitude longer because the system is now in this incredibly fragile, undocumented state which it landed in as a result of an outage. And switching it back to your primary data center without causing another outage is an incredibly delicate problem and everyone's busy and everything's freaked out and, and it's a really, really painful thing. So it's, it's painful to fail over, it's even more painful to fail back. So what we have is this fairy tale. Once upon a time, in theory, if everything works perfectly, we have a plan to survive the disasters we thought of in advance. Yeah, this is just, it's a lovely idea. Um, unlike most fairy tales, it has a rather unhappy ending, though, because it really, in practice, you get, you get it does not work out. Because it, the problem, that thing that went wrong is not the thing you thought of in advance and everything doesn't work perfectly. In fact, your disaster recovery and failover systems, the code paths and the processes are the least well-tested part of your entire environment for almost everybody. Right? As soon as you start getting into some test modes, things go wrong that compound the problem just because everything is piling on in going through exercising code that has never really been tested. Like if you look at test coverage, yeah, my mainstream test coverage might be pretty good. What's your error handling code test coverage? It's terrible. Right. And the combinatorics in it of what might go wrong are even worse. So it's, it's, like, you know, it's, it's really difficult to deal with. So here's some actual things that go wrong. Anyone here ever forget to renew a domain name? It's kind of annoying if it's your personal domain or something. But what if you're a SaaS vendor? This happened last year. Um, pretty much what I remember of this was the CEO tweeting. <laughs> it was the only vehicle they had left that had their name brand on it. So he took the company t Twitter account, which was not related to their domain name, and was tweeting, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> We're working on it. We're trying to get us back up. No, you can't email us. <laughs> None of our internal systems are working. No, we don't have a Slack channel. We have no ability to do anything in the entire company because everything in the company was at companyname.com. And companyname.com was no longer a registered domain. So everything stops. Like, this is like this also is another interesting problem. Um, turns out the fastest way to break anything is DNS. Just if you get at DNS and mess with it, you can take out just about anything. It, it's the weak link in, in almost all the online systems we build, and you, you see this over and over again. So think about this. What would you do? How could you make this more robust? Right, so you think about well, if you'd thought this through, 
you'd maybe have a, a, second, um, a second DNS address that everything would fail over to, you know, company name backup.com. And all your client code and all your failovers, they're sort of redirects built into your system, that maybe your, your web pages have links or something. There's something that somehow knows to redirect to this. You can run it in test. But you have now you have a complete alternate system where you now have a redundant name in your DNS environment. And you could host that name at a different DNS supplier. Right? So now you've got like DNS suppliers occasionally have problems. So now you're working with two different DNS vendors two different names, you've built all your code, you test it, you can actually prove that this works, and this entire class of problems goes away. And I think because DNS is such a weak link, I just wanted to bring this one up. It's something that I've thought about quite a bit. Um, it's kind of a pain to manage multiple DNS vendors, and it's one of the open source projects that I was involved in building when I was at Netflix, a thing called Denominator. It's a Java library with drivers for lots of different DNS vendors, but with a standard API and a very well-designed DNS, uh, DNS uh, object model. DNS is a very well-standardized thing. Most of the libraries for it are pretty flaky. But if you're doing this in Java, there's a, there's a nice library out there. I don't think anyone at Netflix is currently maintaining it. It was mostly me and Adrian Cole that built it, and we both left, so. But it's still out there. So that's one thing that goes wrong. Yeah, yeah, by the way, don't do this. Make sure you renew your DNS <laughs> entries. Uh, okay. If I ask people, everybody's seen this. Like, if you haven't seen this, then you're not really running anything at scale because it's so frequent. Um, so many outages are caused by a certificate. They have timeouts, and you, you install it, and a few years later, it hits the end, and something stops working. It's not usually a total outage of the system. Um, we had various uh, uh, player devi devices, types of devices, would time out because we had the, the, cut, the, if you think about how Netflix works, they're streaming to a device, like a, a games console or something. And the vendor of that device gives you a key to authenticate that that is a valid console, and those keys time out, have to be renewed, and things like that. So um, automatically rotating keys turns into a really interesting thing to be good at. And uh, there's some work, AWS has recently built some products which automatically rotate keys at whatever frequency you want. You know, every few hours, it's just dynamically cycling it through, completely automatic, never even runs out, so that's fine. But think about uh, certificate, security certificates and keys as a way that you can have outages that you should be tracking. We also built a tool, one of the things that Security Monkey did, one of the Netflix automation tools, which looked at all the keys it could find, looked at the dates, and if it got close to a date, it would start sending alerts and screaming at you that this thing needs to be fixed soon, right? So you can build some monitoring for a, a, into a system that goes and somehow finds all of these keys in your, in your system. So that's one. Here's another. I have a friend that works in New York, and he had a bad day. <laughs> the entire data center flooded. When a data center is flooded, it doesn't work very well. Um, underwater computers is something that a few of us have had to work on. Um, and it took him a little while to get it back up because this is the test scenario that they didn't test very often, right? So these things happen. Um, at AWS, we have these zones in each region, and we put the zones between 10 and 100 kilometers apart. They have to be close enough together to have low enough latency to do synchronous writes across them, but far enough apart that they are not in the same tornado track, floodplain, um, you know, power grid, you know, people digging through cables and power cables and all those things, you know, plane crashes, all the things that might take out a building we have to make sure that our zones, the three zones in a region that we typically build, are far enough apart. So if you look at, like, we just have a region in Paris, and there's like, you take Paris, there's like, they're all different corners of Paris, right? They're all across. Um, that's kind of the, the way it does. We don't tell people where they are for security reasons, but they are, you know, you want to make them far enough apart that, that uh, if you lose one zone, the other, you have two left that everything can work on. And then just, you know, it's going to be annoying that you, know, you go back from this conference and something will break horribly. Right? This is just going to happen. So how can you deal with it? And this is, this is some great advice. Chris Pinkham built the very first version of uh, AWS EC2 about 10, 10 years ago. And I was uh, quite a long, you know, only a few years after that, I was at a conference and talking to him. And this, this is a phrase he came up with. You can't legislate against failure. You can't think of everything that could go wrong and write a rule saying this should not happen. 
There's too many different ways things can go wrong. So what he said was you should focus instead on fast detection and response. And if you are very, very good at detecting that something went wrong and very fast at responding to it, you can handle anything that gets thrown at you. And this is the basis, this is the philosophy behind the way AWS runs its incidents. Um, you know, you, you, you obviously take care of the obvious stuff, but if you think about the, you know, the example I had this morning, the drift into failure example, these are problems that have never happened in 95 million hours of flying and then the plane crashes, right? Those, you, didn't, you can't legislate against that failure because it's got, you know, it's like 30 years after they built the plane, they have a problem. Um, but if they'd had better detection response, then maybe they would have been able to find that, that problem that had never happened before. And that's the kind of thing you're looking for. And then, you know, how do you know that your system works at all? Um, so that's a more observability issue. And how is it supposed to recover after the failure goes away? Right, you get, this is the problem of these data center failover and then not being able to fail back easily. How do you resynchronize your data afterwards? Um, hope, some of you may have been in Kyle's talk yesterday. He was up here. There was actually not that many people in his talk. It was disappointing. But Cal Kingsbury uh, and Peter Bayliss wrote a, a really nice paper in ACMQ called The Network is Reliable. Um, of course, the network isn't reliable, and that's the point. The, this is the first fallacy of distributed computing, right? you know, along with you know, bandwidth is infinite and latency is zero and things. But the network is reliable is the first fallacy. And it's a great paper. It lists all the ways. Or it's just a list of cases, case studies, where people were caught out by the fact that networks partition and behave strangely. And it's a great way of thinking about this. And this is a network between your customer and you, and, or you and your cloud, or the cloud between your different machines and your data center. Or the cloud. There's, there's lots of different networks here. The, 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 most, the, the nearest you can get to a non-network system is probably sitting at the console of a, of, a, of a PC or something. You're there. There's no network. It just runs locally. right? And that's not a very useful system, because your customers are further away from wherever you had your computers. Um, my talk this morning, the keynote, was mostly about this book in chapter two, so I won't go into that in great detail, other than that I tell people not to read this on aircraft because it's got plane crashes in it, and that was, this morning was the story of those plane crashes. Release It um, is another really interesting book. The first edition of this is one of the books I gave to Ben Christensen uh, and Ben Schmaus, and they went and built Hystrix, which is the circuit breaker code, which is quite well known now. And the whole idea of circuit breakers came from the first release it book. But it was nice to have an implementation of it and to be, um, to be sort of part of this role as an architect was to give the right books to the right people and hopefully at the right time or early enough that they got the ideas and then they ran with it. So this, you, know, you can kind of say I was there at the birth of the idea and then they I don't, had nothing to do with the implementation of it. But making sure you feed the right ideas to the right people and ask the right questions is kind of one of the things that I like to do. Second edition came out fairly recently, and um, there's a lot of, lot of great updates in this. And hopefully when you go to conferences, Michael's not at this one, but he's at a lot of go-to and QCon kind of conferences. It's definitely worth seeing. So I'm going to talk about chaos architecture. And the way I think about this is that there's four layers, two teams, uh, and it's an attitude as well. So let's go through these layers. Base layer, infrastructure and services, the building blocks, the Lego bricks you're building out of. The key thing here, you want to make sure you have more than one way to do everything and more than one place to put everything. Right? So we want to have, there's all of these things. That I've just put some of the regions we have. Um, you want to have no single point of failure. So you maybe want zones and regions and maybe different ways of getting things done. So that's pretty basic. Most people get that. Um, the difficult bit is the next level. Because now you've got to figure out how do you interconnect these things, how do you connect your customers to these redundant places, and how do you switch things? And that means if you're going to switch customers from being serviced in one location to another, the data has to be there to serve them. Now, if this is zones in a region that's synchronous, the data's already there. But if you're going cross-region, you have to now come up with some cross-region or cross-data center replication model, and you've got to understand latency, eventual consistency, all these things. And you've got to do traffic routing. So if something goes down, you've got to reroute the customers to somewhere else. And then when it comes back up again, you've got to do this anti-entropy recovery because your system is now in an inconsistent state. You have updates over here, 
but because the network was down or the system was down, it doesn't see the update. So what is your system for doing the anti-entropy recovery and getting everything back into place? Um, Carl Kens, we talked quite a bit about some of these yesterday. If you look, if using something like Cassandra, they have an anti-entropy algorithm that runs continuously, and then there's sort of a daily version of it that generates Merkle trees and combines them to figure out, to keep everything in sync. But that's the sort of automated model. Or maybe it's just like resilvering a disk, right? If you know about mirrored disks, disk comes down, you replace it, you have to just copy everything over it. Maybe that simple. So think about this level, again, this is the mo least well-tested part of any system, right? You, you, find, you find in general cases, um, you're building a highly available system, but if you're not testing it often and, and in sort of interesting ways, you're not really handling all the error code handling parts and the people and processes involved in making sure that you can reroute things and, and make it all work. So that's the switching layer. Above that, we have applications. And what do you do, what does your application do if it gets an error or it gets a really slow response or there's, it loses, a, it drops a connection? Um, I mean, normal use, your application just runs so you don't have this problem, but uh, it's fairly easy to test. These are, you know, particularly if it's a microservice, a microservice does one thing. So it's got a single verb or noun or whatever it does and it's got a fairly bounded set of dependencies and if it's just that, can I do this one thing? It's relatively easy to test. And you can feed it bad data and make sure it does the right thing and returns the right, you know, returns something interesting or doesn't just collapse in a heap or maybe write the wrong data into the wrong place. You want to avoid corruption. You want to avoid anything that looks like silent data corruption. Um, but this is, if, you, if you're doing this with a monolithic app, it's got, you know, it does 100 different things. And it's got all these APIs and it does lots and lots of things. It's much more complex to reason about the behavior of, of an app that does more than one thing. So this is one of the reasons why microservices help build you these more reliable systems because you can reason about the behavior of every individual component separately and you can test them separately. You can iterate on them separately. So that's the application. And above that, there are these pesky things called operators and users, but people, right? And when systems are recovering from problems, they start behaving differently from the way you normally see them operate, and people will then intervene and break them. <laughs> like a system that was like struggling to survive and it's doing its, doing its best to recover and you've, it's exercising all those code paths, it behaves strangely. You go, I think I'm gonna reboot this one, and then it usually makes that worse. Um, in a distributed system, re a reboot may be the best thing to do on your PC or your phone, but in a distributed system, it usually makes it worse and, and it kind of should be a last resort thing. There's a lot of cases, a lot of non-restartable applications, it turns out. So lots of examples of this. My, my kind of favorite example, I think, is the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Right, most people have heard of it. Um, you know, a reactor melted down. Yeah, but why did it melt down? It didn't melt down because the reactor failed. It, reacted, it melted down because the operators were running some tests. And during the tests, they got confused about what was going on. And, they, and it started going out of control. And because they were in the middle of a test and they'd never seen it go out of control, they started ignoring alarms and, trying, and just got confused. And the thing got totally out of control and melted down. But the initial cause was that they were running some tests and then they got confused. It may feel like a cause, right? But you think that the initial cause was that there wasn't enough um, usability in the design, and you know, the causes go back a long way, but you know, the, the actual thing that, that triggered this, the last trigger was that they, that they got confused when they were running some tests to prove that it was, work, that it was working fine. So that's a, another example. Uh, I showed this this morning, so every time you go to a building, you see the elevators, there's a don't use the elevators in case of fire, and you see in the parking lot there's an assembly point, all these things. We know we do this, it's kind of boring, until the building really is on fire and then you get out safely and people survive. So that's, this is, this is people testing. It's universal, it's everywhere in the world. We know how to save lives by having standardized responses to a specific type of incident and ways to, you know, fire alarms. We know what the fire alarm sounds like and we know what we're supposed to do, right? So the question then is who runs the fire drill for IT in your own infrastructure? What does that alarm sound like? 
And does everyone know what to do when the alarm happens? They know where to go, what to do, how to find the right dashboards, how to log into the right systems, how to call the right phone number, how to behave on that phone, on that conference call where you're talking about what's going on, um, how to work fast resolution. This is all stuff you can practice. So that's the people level. So my answer to this is that you should probably have a chaos engineering team. It's good to have it be a separate team, but it may just be something that people do. And maybe there's somebody in your company is the person that always fixes it when things break. Maybe they don't, they don't actually have that title, but they are effectively the chaos engineer. And there's a, a great book. You can get a signed copy of this at lunch uh, from Casey. Um, he was one of the lead authors on this. And this has kind of given it a name and a, a basic set of principles. They have their, their, um, their whole uh, ethos and, and the way you think about this. So I'm going to go through this in a little bit more detail. There's a series of tools, and these tools operate at these different levels, and you have to think about all these levels. So a game day is how you exercise people. And if, if you do nothing else, if you have the most fragile application that you don't run any chaos monkeys, of, you know, don't touch my app, exercise the people. Say, OK, we're just going to get everybody. We're going to simulate what happens when there's an outage. And we're going to get you through a training program where everybody is trained in what to do and how to manage it. And you can call it a game day or a training program or whatever. Um, or you could just say that if, you know, the only people that are supposed to be on call in a real event should have gone through this training. So part of your onboarding of people or onboarding people to manage critical infrastructure is that they've gone through some kind of exercise that says, this is how we run this, and this is what's expected, and this is where all of the dashboards are, and this is how you log into this Slack channel, and do you have your credentials, and all of the things you need are at hand, and you run these set training things often enough that when you go to it, you remember how it works. Right? You don't want this to be a once a year thing because you'll forget and the all of the credentials will have changed, and the dashboards will have changed, and all those things, right? So that game day level is, is where I would start. Once you get that done, you, the game day will expose, I, we have bad monitoring data. OK, we can go fix that. Uh, you can start making you, your system more observable, and you can work on responding quickly, even for the most fragile code, the most sort of broken system, things where you can't change the source code or the, or the installation at all. You can still respond more quickly to it. So that's where I'd start. And then the application, you can start testing that um, for failure modes. Make sure you've got that in your test suite, or canary testing kind of things. Test the switching layer. This is more disaster recovery, failover, tr testing things like that, um, pulling, out what, pulling, pulling wires out in the data center or turning off networks. So the Simeon Army is a set of applications that Netflix open sourced, which is a, a chaos monkey and a whole bunch of things that go around um, deleting machines and proving that you've got resilience. The whole point of chaos monkey wasn't just to kill machines. It was to ensure that you were using autoscalers. Like our standard practice was all machines should be in an autoscale group, and the autoscale should say there should be six of these machines. And if you kill one, the autoscaler should say, OK, one's missing. I'll make another one. Right. That was what Chaos Monkey was designed to test. It was to enforce the architectural pattern of having autoscalers and stateless machines. So no session state, uh, no uh, application state, nothing stored to local disk. You can delete a machine, and you just have request state. And if the request didn't respond, you can kill the machine, and it will, somebody will retry on another machine, and that request will happen somewhere else. Right. Um, if you finish your, your, your request, you write data out. So then you get into idempotent requests and things. But there's, this is kind of the pattern we were trying to encourage. By just having a chaos monkey occasionally deleting machines, it caused a bunch of the right uh, algorithms, distributed systems algorithms, to work. Chaos Toolkit you heard about from Russ earlier, if you were in the previous talk. Uh, open source project. Uh, we're starting to figure out how to use it for a few different things. Um, I'm going to be in Copenhagen next week for the KubeConf. Uh, I'm the representative for CNCF for AWS, and we're, looking, we're doing all Kubernetes work. Chaos Toolkit has drivers for Kubernetes and drivers for EC2. And what we're trying to get to is the point where you can set up some standard tests, which will you know, mess with your pods and, and do things, do chaos experiments at the Kubernetes level that are very portable and standard that anybody could apply to any application. And then we want to go under the hood and pointed at your EC2 instances and actually try to shoot down, say, your etc.d or your master and make sure that Kubernetes itself is recovering or partition 
uh, one of the zones that we're running on three zones in Kubernetes. So you want to basically be able to simulate the various failures and show that Kubernetes control plane keeps working and also show what happens if applications fail. And I think the interesting thing is one is Kubernetes is very standard across lots of vendors so we can work collaboratively with lots of people. And then also that Chaos Toolkit's an open source project that's got a nice API for designing these things. So this is an interesting area of work. It's one of the reasons we've been spending a bit of time with Russ and uh, Sylvain recently. CHAP is the Chaos Automation Platform. It's a Netflix tool. It runs, uh, last thing I heard was 1,500 automated tests a day. I have a hypothesis that if I poke at this service, the customers shouldn't notice. So I'll go poke at that service. And, if the, if, and I'm measuring this metric. And if I see anything wiggle in the customer metric, I stop immediately and say, OK, here's something that's dodgy. Like, why, when you poke at this thing, or generate errors in this part of the system, the customers notice like there is something broken in the way our, our configuration is set up, or there's a bug's been introduced. So they have all these assertions about the uh, ability to absorb failure inside the system. And Gremlin, uh, they're here at the conference, one of the sponsors, they have an automated platform for doing very detailed, invasive, um, chaos testing and injecting things. So they get in IP tables and block traffic. Like they'll block DNS traffic or they'll fill up a disk or stuff like that. Um, and then if they notice any problem, they back out very carefully. And they also do a lot of very uh, security. Uh, you, this is a, a attack vector to your system if you have the ability to do this. So they do it in a very secure way. And it's a commercial product. So think about Chaos Toolkit's an open source toolkit for managing the overall ideas that, that you're trying to test against. And Gremlin is a much more hardened project, uh, product for uh, securely and safely injecting failures into systems. So that's Chaos Engineering team. The other team that I think is interesting is the security red team. And many companies now have red teams. This is the team whose job is to try and break into your system. It's kind of like an extension of the penetration test items, but instead of like every six months or so scheduling, you know, paying some outside company to run a pen test, this is a continuous thing. This is a team who's trying to break in every day. Right, you know, uh, Sharon Lights of um, Shannon Lights of uh, Intuit. So every Monday morning they come in and say, "Well, let's see what the developers did last week." Oh, there's another bug. <laughs> we, we got in here, we got in here, and then they brought a little report, and then the developers get to go fix it, right? Or maybe if it's really bad, maybe they shut down or roll back to the previous version or something. But that's kind of the pattern they're in. They're they're aggressively trying to find any kind of way they they have on any weaknesses you have into their system. Right? Every time there's a new um, you know, a new publication about a, uh, a new security bug, you know, all of these security bugs that happen, they go, okay, let's see if we're susceptible to this one, and they can find the weak links and get, get rid of it quickly. Now, if you're not doing that, and you just have the security team trying to make it secure, you don't really know how good a job they're doing. You need this sort of adversarial thing. So the, 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 the chaos engineering tiering is sort of the adversarial team to the availability, people ever trying to make your apps available, and the chaos um, the security team are doing this on the, on the sort of, because it's really the same thing. You're, you're, you're as strong as your weakest link, and that applies to security and availability. But availability, it's more random events, and security, the, people can discover some failure, some latent flaw in your system, and, and, and exploit it without you having any you know, randomness in there. So it's a little bit different the way they arise. So there's the two systems. Um, the security team, there's a few interesting tools here. At the people level, right? How, how many people, like, you know, you get your laptop gets owned occasionally. You get the nasty pop-up saying, please send us some Bitcoin. <laughs> and, or even maybe you didn't realize it, but all your data is being exfiltrated to some other country uh, where your competitors are collecting it. Um, that's because you clicked on a link you weren't supposed to click on, you didn't realize. So uh, SafeStack Ava is actually a... Uh, it simulates spear phishing emails. It will send them to your employees and, and say, hey, click on this link for this thing, you know, free whatever. And if you click on it, it says, no, you shouldn't have clicked on this link. This was a bad email. And you're trying to train the employees to be hyper vigilant to what they do uh, when they're on their machines where this matters. Uh, at Netflix, we did something similar. Um, but we also lay, had USB keys lying around. We used to leave them lying around in the cafeteria. And if you plugged it into your laptop, it would pop up and say, you should not have plugged this into your laptop because I, just, I now own your laptop. Um, please hand them into reception. 
right, if you find a USB case. So this is human conditioning. It's necessary. We're, we do a lot of this kind of stuff. Amazon is good at doing this, particularly because of all of the data that we hold and, and the trust we have in our systems. We are very vigilant about this. Um, another level down, infection monkey. This is one of the scariest monkeys that I've heard of. There's a company called Gardecore, and they will actually take over your entire network. They'll, they'll do it nicely, and they'll tell you what they're doing as they do it. It's a little tool they run, and it basically hops from machine to machine using exploits to infect all your, all your infrastructure. It generates a nice map of your infrastructure, which might be a useful thing. Uh, um, they're a penetration, well, they're a security company. Um, they're a little scary. They're one of these Israeli uh, companies where they used to do this for a living for a decade, and now they do it for good rather than doing it for the, the Israeli military. So, um, but if you really want to be sure that your machines are, aren't, uh, cannot be owned as a group, it's probably worth rusting. I'd run this in a very isolated test environment. Like, and if, if it passes that, then maybe try production just to be sure you, you're safe. But, you know, some of these tools are a bit scary. Chaos Slinger is a really interesting one. It's another open source project. I think it was, it's done by United Health, and it's the first open source project coming out of a healthcare company. It's like, cool. Like, random people that you would not expect to have open source programs are now getting sufficiently inspired that they're sticking out an open source project that does something interesting. So this is policy enforcement, right? You have a policy, most best example, we have S3 buckets, right? Everyone has S3 buckets, because they use AWS, and those buckets are not supposed to be readable by the world, right? So you have this policy, and then somewhere you have some software that's trying to enforce this policy. What Chaos Slinger will do is it will create an S3 bucket that is world readable, and then sit back and go, did the policy system notice, right? It creates uh, policy exceptions programmatically to test that your policy enforcement system is correctly noticing that those, in those enforcements are happening right. That's the idea of it. It's kind of a nice little tool. Um, and then some vendors in this space, Attack IQ and Safe Breach, that will go and help you manage your, your, your red teams. OK, so the attitude here is kind of break it to make it better, but it's really break it to make it safer. And I did a whole talk this morning on safety where I talked about Todd Conklin. He wrote a book. Um, on fatalities, but he's got a great podcast. I've been listening to this podcast for a couple of years. I did a, a, a recording with him about uh, Chaos Monkey once, and I'm planning to do another recording with him soon. And then John Orspor, who was CTO of Etsy, he's done a lot of work on human factors and reliability and safety. And there's a, you can just, Stella.report is a URL. So dot .report is a very long domain name, but um, a root domain, but go read this. Lots of useful information, and it's the it's a bringing together of the safety uh, thought leaders with the software people to kind of combine the thoughts and, and figure out what should we really be doing to build safe systems. And as we're t talking about things like self-driving cars that don't crash and kill people, planes that don't crash, um, drones that don't fly into people, um, there's a lot of areas now where we're getting into software systems that are building very safety critical environments. So that's Todd and um, John. There's another, another author I've mentioned is Sidney Decker. And this is, a, this is an interesting phrase. It, I was reading his most recent book, which is called The Safety Anarchist, and he keeps talking about synoptic illegibility. And he uses this phrase about every page in the book he's talking about synoptic, think that synoptic illegible. And eventually you figure out what he's talking about. And it's always good to go for a conference with a new phrase to baffle your colleagues with. Um, it means you can't write down exactly what happens. It means that the, the, man, the, the, the safety manual says, if this, do that. It's a run book, right? It basically, this tells you run books don't work. This is why run books don't work, because the run book is trying to manage something which is more complex than it's possible to write down. Right. It's easy, there's the permutations, the permutational explosion of complexity and the number of combinations of things that can happen means that you can't write down every possible thing that could happen. So you go through it a bit and then you end off, okay, there's no rule for this, right? So it means that the human at that point has to start using judgment. But if they've been trained to follow the process, they've been trained to not use their judgment because they're supposed to follow the rules. But what happens when you run out of rules, all of a sudden you have to use your judgment. And the point of this book is that you should be using judgment more. You should say, this is a system 
where I'm going to use the human judgment to do the right thing and to figure out what to do, rather than relying on our ability to write it down. So what this means is system safety is an emergent property of a system, and the humans are part of that system and the way they feed back and the way they track it. Now, that's, there's another side of this, which is we're starting to automate some of the things these humans do. So how do you build uh, a, a, a software system which handles uh, uncertain, strange you know, combinations and combinatorics? So there's a lot of challenges here. But I think this is an interesting book. Um, Safety anarchist, he's an anarchist in the sense that he thinks that he doesn't believe in the rules that people are putting in. It's an anarchist in that sense. It's not anarchy, it's an anarchist. Anarchy, anarchist is somebody that doesn't like centralized rules. That's, that's the point he's making. So, failures are not a, um, a root thing that has a root cause. It's not, they, don't, they aren't caused by having a, a component fail or a human fail, they're a problem of lack of safety margin. Because you should have designed the system to allow those components to fail. Like, you know, you have mirrored disks. You're assuming a disk will fail without affecting the rest of the system, right? So, um, but if you have an outage because a disk failed, that means you didn't put enough redundancy in or you didn't build the right way to switch around it. So that was lack of safety margin. And I got a little thought experiment here. I just, I'm actually pretty much on a cliff edge here, but let's say I blinded myself, blindfolded myself, and started wandering around this stage. And there's a, there's a kind of a cliff here. I do not want to fall off this cliff. So if I'm getting near there and I've got my eyes closed, I'm kind of going to go, okay, am I near it yet? <laughs> Is this safe? Do I want, how close do I want to be? How far can I go in any one dimension without falling off the cliff, right? So you have to be pretty careful. The other thing you could do is take off the blindfold and say, okay, I can see the edge now, <laughs> right? So if you're building a system, uh, how can you make your boundaries, your safety margins observable, right? In some cases, we do. Like, if you're looking at CPU busy, right, and you don't want your machine to overload, you're looking at how much idle time do you have, and you know that when the machine gets above, you know, 80, 90% busy, it stops working well. So that's your safety margin. You've got 20, 30% CPU headroom. And you can measure that, and you can monitor it, and you can go track those things. But a lot of the time, we're building systems where we don't know what the safety margin is. And you have to inject errors to find out what happens and to find out how much actual margin you've got. Because somewhere in the system, there's a thing that's going to run out of threads. Like, there's always that thing that runs out of threads when everything gets slow. Because when, you, when the system slows down, think the processes hang on to threads for longer, and that's when you run out of threads. So it's like, generic problem. Always happens, right? You will find that. So, but these are all invisible limits that you didn't notice because in normal operation, they don't, they don't constrain you. So you have to test these things. So what we're really talking about here is hypothesis testing. We think we've got some safety margin. Let's really carefully test without, in production without causing an issue. So the goal here is never to cause an issue, but to be, do it in production so we're really sure that our production system is the one that needs to be reliable. Yeah, you can run these tests, you can run this in a test environment, but your test environment doesn't need to be reliable. It's just, you know, giving you a first pass approximation that you haven't broken anything and maybe use it for debugging your tests your, your test themselves. But in production, you really have to run this stuff to know that production is going to work. So just to wrap up, what chaos testing ensures is that these four levels, You've got experienced staff running robust applications. You have a dependable switching fabric, and that's running on a redundant so f service foundation, whatever that happens to be, cloud or data center or whatever. Um, and what's actually happening in industry is we're seeing this really expensive custom disaster recovery systems where you have two what I call artisanal snowflake data centers, which are in random states. They're very hard to do disaster recovery failures between them but two cloud accounts are identical. They have the same APIs. You can deploy the same things to them. It's much more reliable, it's much more automatable, and it's much more possible now to take disaster recovery from something that is hard to do, expensive, and difficult to something that is productized, easy to run, and you can run it every day or you can run it every few weeks rather than being something that you're scared to do once a year. And this comes back to some of those principles like in continuous delivery, if it hurts, do it more often until they figure out how to make it stop hurting. It's the same principle. We're doing continuous disaster recovery in the same way as we were doing continuous delivery of code rather than sort of monolithic waterfall annual releases, right? It's the same principles being applied here. 
So that's it, and I think we're kind of at lunchtime now, but um, happy to take a few questions, and um, I'll be here uh, all afternoon for more discussions. So I hope that's interesting.